The 98-year-old passed away Sunday after battling lung cancer. Presidents, current and past, as well as members of Congress and military dignitaries will pay their final respects. President Biden served with Dole in the Senate for more than 20 years and remembered him as a friend, a colleague, calling Dole, quote, an American statesman like few in our history. Chief White House correspondent Nancy Cordes is outside the cathedral. Nancy, walk us through the program just ahead. Great to be with you, Major. Yes, uh, as you can see, there are hundreds of Washington dignitaries, past and present, who are already seating, seated awaiting this funeral. And today we're going to hear from the president himself, Joe Biden, who spoke uh, about his old friend Bob Dole in the Capitol Rotunda as well. Yesterday, the two had a long and very fond relationship. In fact, at one point uh, years ago, uh, Biden even said that if he were to choose a Republican to be president, it would be Bob Dole. We're also going to hear from Tom Daschle. He was the Democratic leader of the Senate briefly while Dole was Republican leader. They worked together so well on a host of issues, particularly of importance to their farm states of Kansas and South Dakota. Then we're also going to hear from Pat Roberts, who, like Dole, is a former senator from Kansas. He served uh, in the Senate for 40 years, just recently retired, and considered Dole something of a mentor. So we're likely to hear some personal stories from him and, of course, from Dole's daughter, his only child, Robin Dole, who will be speaking today. So based on the speakers who have been chosen at this funeral to eulogize this legend, I expect we'll hear a lot about his history of working across the aisle, but also a lot about his sense of humor and his private side as a father and a friend. Nancy Cordes, thank you so much at Washington National Cathedral. Our chief political analyst, John Dickerson, joins us from New York. John, uh, let me say it this way. You and I are correspondents of a certain age, which means we covered Bob Dole either on Capitol Hill or on the presidential campaign trail. One thing that strikes me in all the things that have been said laudably about Bob Dole but might have been missed is that in the early 80s, mid 80s and early 90s, he was somewhat unusual in American politics for surrounding himself with powerful women, not just his wife, Elizabeth Dole, but Sheila Burke, his chief of staff on Capitol Hill, and Joanne Cole, his chief scheduler. He was not uncomfortable around women who he put in places of prominence, was he? I remember one of my first stories covering the Dole presidential campaign. My bureau chief at the time looked at my reporting and he said, but have you talked to Sheila Burke? And I gave some insufficient answer. And he said, unless you talk to Sheila Burke, you don't know you aren't in the first circle of what's happening. In other words, she was that close uh, to Senator Dole. And Joanne Coe was, ma was made the, uh, the first woman to be the secretary of the Senate. She also ran his campaign for a little while. She then, of course, helped uh, Senator Dole raise money for the World War II Memorial. He was quite comfortable, and they were uh, people who were in positions of power and also who, who shared uh, his his w entire worldview to be that close to him uh, and to serve him that long and that faithfully. One other thing I observed covering Bob Dole, and this was true of other people who served in Congress who'd actually been in war, they didn't treat politics, particularly legislative politics, as if it were war. Some who I've covered who haven't been in war, who don't know the horrors of that up close, act as if politics is as high stakes. Bob Dole never did. You put your finger on something that is it just has been hitting me time and time again as I've been thinking about Senator Dole. That's exactly right. And that's why in his convention speech, uh, Senator, in 1996, Senator Dole could say, my opponent, President Clinton, and then interrupt himself and say, he's my opponent, not my enemy. He understood the distinction and the difference. And he also understood uh, because he had convalesced next to Senator Daniel Inouye, uh, from Hawaii when they were both in Michigan, um, that you couldn't find somebody, an enemy, who had also been as gravely injured and, and, decor and was a decorated veteran uh, in the same war and same cause in fighting for, Ameri in for, fighting for America. Uh, and he also understood the, the uh, preciousness of life and uh, the determination that caused him to, to fight back and that there were all kinds of people 
uh, going through similar struggles uh, in the other party. Um, it was, it's absolutely one of the big distinctions between the politics of, of Senator Dole's time, which he fought quite uh, roughly. I mean, he was a partisan, there's no question, but he understood where the line was because he had that larger view. John Dickerson in New York, thank you so very much. A celebration of Dole's life will be held later today at the World War II Memorial right here in Washington. Congressional correspondent Chris Van Cleve is at the memorial, which Dole worked aggressively and tirelessly to help create. Chris? Major, in fact, there is a plaque here as you come into the World War II Memorial noting that Bob Dole was instrumental in getting this built. He ran, ran the fundraising effort to raise the money to, to build this place, but after it was built, it remained very special to him. He was deeply involved with the Honor Flights program that brought World War II veterans here to Washington. If he didn't meet veterans at the airport, he was known to surprise them here at the World War II Memorial. Uh, so this was a place that was very close to his heart. It is hollowed ground, certainly. Uh, we will see a ceremony here later today. General Milley will speak. Tom Hanks, the actor, will speak. Uh, Mr. Hanks was uh, deeply involved with raising the funds as well to build this place. Uh, Elizabeth Dole, the, the former senator, and Robin Dole uh, will both be here, uh, as well as, uh, as once again, Senator Bob Dole is remembered here at the Washington, here at the World War II Memorial that he was so instrumental in having built. Chris Van Cleve, I'm so glad you mentioned the plaque there because there's a story that the late Senator Daniel Inouye of Hawaii tells about the idea of putting that plaque there and the original reaction to those constructing it was, well, we don't do that. That doesn't happen. We don't put plaques for individual people at national monuments. Daniel Inouye, using a bit of low-level profanity, said the hell with that. We're putting a plaque there for Bob Dole. That's why it is there. I want to turn back now to the Washington National Cathedral where our chief White House correspondent Nancy Cordes is. Nancy, um, it happens in Washington with some frequency. Who's there? Who isn't? But in this case, it does seem to matter. Tell us. It does. Well, uh, former Republican Vice President Dick Cheney is here today. Uh, you heard John talking about the race between Dole and Bill Clinton for president in 1996. Uh, that opponent, not enemy, former President Bill Clinton is here as well today. Uh, former Vice President Mike Pence is sitting very near to President Clinton. Notably, uh, one individual who's not here today is former President Donald Trump, uh, which is interesting because Bob Dole was famously the only prominent former Republican presidential nominee to actually endorse Donald Trump for president. Uh, no explanation given for why uh, President Trump is not here, uh, but nevertheless, he and, and Melania Trump are not attending this funeral. We also spotted Tom Hanks, who, as Chris mentioned, has done so much to keep stories about World War II alive. So he is uh, among those paying tribute today. And then just an enormous number of senators uh, from both the Republican and Democratic side of the aisle here to acknowledge a man who, uh, while it might he may even have acknowledged himself was a mediocre campaigner during his several bids for the presidency. He was a master legislator and got quite a bit done during his 30 years in the Senate, including getting the Americans with Disabilities Act passed, expanding school lunches, um, expanding food stamps. Uh, he worked to raise taxes when it was important to do so. He worked to lower taxes when it was important to do so and really prided himself, particularly in his later years, uh, of being able to work across the aisle uh, to the degree, Major, that the balcony outside of the Republican leader's office is still called Dole Balcony today, or uh, fondly referred to as Dole Beach because he loved to work on his famous tan out there on the balcony while he was cutting deals. It was very important terrain, and any reporter who was allowed to go out there, even for a moment, felt the touch of Bob Dole's primacy on Capitol Hill. John Dickerson, back to you in New York just for one second. We're advised President Biden has arrived, so the proceedings should get underway in the not-too-distant future. You have thought and written eloquently about the presidency, about legislative compromise, and it strikes me that one of the things that Bob Dole brought to that process was the idea of durability. And he believed compromise that was truly bipartisan was, in fact, durable. And durability is what mattered in the legislative process, not a result purely on partisan grounds. Your thoughts? 
he had the long view. He saw the durability that you talk about as necessary for stability and that you only get that uh, by listening to everybody, including people on your own side, uh, and getting their buy-in. Um, and you think about some of the difficult votes he cast also on two big ones come to mind for me on Social Security uh, and in the 1991 in, in 1983 and 1991 in the budget deal with with George Bush. Those were efforts to do hard things in the short term, extremely hard things with Democrats uh, in order to put America on a sustained footing for the long term. We don't see a great deal of that anymore. In fact, reading over my old notes and old clips about the obsession with deficit reduction and the hard votes taken to get deficit reduction, it seems almost like reading something from the 18th century. It seems so distant from the conversations we have today. And John, it seems to me if you're listening to this or watching this at home and you are safe and comfortable with the reliability of your social security check, you have Bob Dole to thank for it. If you are in the disability community in this country and your life has been transformed by a singular act in Congress, you have in part Bob Dole to thank for that. That's what durability means when you're a legislator. That's exactly exactly right. And one other thing, Major, which is which is a little bit of a side note. But when you look at Dole and all of the adversity he faced, somebody who came out of high school as as the athlete and the whole world in front of him, and then to be left for dead, and then to to go through the struggle he had to get well, and then the various defeats in life, he was never a whiner. He was an incredible model of resiliency, and as he later would say. Doing things the hard way was proof you were doing it the right way. Uh, that kind of model in public life and the utter lack of whininess um, is really also an important part of his legacy. John, as you well remember on Capitol Hill, Bob Dole, though this wasn't a phrase at the time, was in every way a multitasker when he was leader of the Senate. He would have three or four conferences going on in his office. He would start each one of them like, here's the issue, work it out, I'll be back leaving it to other people, lieutenants and other trusted members of his party, or both parties, to sort out the details, and he would provide the leadership role. Multitasking, though, we didn't call it that back then. Exactly. And when you also look at some of his solutions, which would take us about 20 minutes to explain because they are in the nuts and bolts of how you get legislation done, the, where those solutions came from were essentially an effort on his part to give individual members what they needed so they could represent their constituents, their states, in a way that was honest to, to the way they saw politics. And knowing how to both let them do the work, but also how to create solutions so that people could get to yes and get things done. It sounds impossibly complicated unless you're in the middle of it, but it's really the only way you get things done. John Dickerson in New York. We're going to pause now and let the funeral service for the late Bob Dole, presidential nominee, vice presidential nominee, statesman in American politics, begin from the Washington National Cathedral as we watch Elizabeth Dole make her way inside. Let's listen.
resurrection and I am life says the Lord whoever has faith in me shall have life even though they die and everyone who has life and has committed himself to me in faith shall not die forever As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives and that at the last he will stand upon the earth. After my awaking, he will raise me up and in my body I shall see God. I myself shall see, and my eyes behold him who is my friend and not a stranger. For none of us lives to himself, and no one becomes his own master when he dies. For if we have life, we are alive in the Lord. And if we die, we die in the Lord. 
So then, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's possession. Happy from now on are those who die in the Lord. So it is, says the Spirit, for they rest from their labors. Good morning. My name is Randy Hollerith, and I am the Dean of Washington National Cathedral. On behalf of Mary Ann Buddy, the Bishop of the Diocese of Washington, and Michael Curry, the presiding Bishop of the Episcopal Church, welcome. Welcome to this house of prayer for all people. We are honored to host this service for Senator Dole. Yet we recognize that we are gathering yet again to lay to rest a great American only five weeks after having saying farewell to another icon in our nation, Colin Powell. We have indeed seen too much loss in recent days. To Elizabeth, Robin, and the entire Dole family, please know that this cathedral and this nation grieves with you, and you are in our prayers. Bob Dole was one of the greatest of the greatest generation, a patriot who always placed country above partisanship and politics. While we mourn his loss, we gather this morning to give thanks for and to celebrate his extraordinary life. Though Senator Dole has gone from us, he is not lost. The same God who raised Jesus from the dead will raise Bob Dole as well. That is the good news. Our faith tells us that we will meet again in a place where there is no death, no sorrow and pain are no more, where there is only life everlasting. This then isn't goodbye, because in God's story, death never has the last word. For now, it is enough to say on behalf of a grateful nation, well done, good and faithful servant, well done. Thank you.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, whose mercies cannot be numbered, accept our prayers on behalf of your servant, Bob, and grant him an entrance into the land of light and joy in the fellowship of your saints. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understandings no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. The word of the Lord. Reverend clergy, distinguished guests, among the many memories from 50 years of friendship, there's one that especially captures what Bob Dole was as a man and in my view as a patriot. We were on our way to the 50th anniversary of D-Day in Normandy, but we started in Italy, in Anzio. Much of uh, has been written about his time in Anzio, but to be there with him felt significantly different. He was on a mission in the mountains. Nazi gunfire and mortar fire was thick. A man was dying, men were dying, facing a hail of bullets. Second Lieutenant Robert Joseph Dole hurled a grenade into an empty gun nest. He was trying to help a fallen comrade, his platoon radio men, when everything changed. And I mean everything changed. His spine was damaged because fire tore across the hills shattering his body, grievously wounded, 
he was paralyzed. Dragged behind a wall, Bob would pass in and out of consciousness, dreaming of home as he lay bleeding in a foxhole for nearly nine hours. He was 21 years old. Nearly eight decades on, we gather here in a world far different from the mountains battlefield in 1949 or 45. But there's something, there's something that connects that past and present, wartime and peace, then and now. The courage, the grit, the goodness, and the grace of Second Lieutenant named Bob Dole, who became Congressman Dole, Senator Dole, statesman, husband, father, friend, colleague, and a word that's often overused but not here, a genuine hero, Bob Dole. Dean and the clergy officiating today's service, President Clinton, Vice President Harris, Vice President Pence and Cheney and Quayle, Speaker Pelosi, Leader Schumer, Leader McConnell, members of Congress of both parties, past and present, members of the Cabinet, General Milley, and leaders of our military, distinguished guests, most of all, the Dole family. Elizabeth, it's been said that memory is the power to gather roses in winter. Bob left you with 45 years' worth of roses of a life built and a love shared that's going to guide you through the difficult days ahead. Jill and I will always be there for you, as many others in this church will be, as you and Bob were always there for us in ways nobody knows. And Robin, you carry your father's pride, grace, and character. He's always going to be with you. As the old saying goes, we Irish say, you are your father's daughter. You are your father's daughter. Bob Dole's story is a very American one. Born and raised in a three-room house through the Dust Bowl of the Great Depression, shipped out as a young man to World War II, wounded in battle on the same weekend that Franklin Delano Roosevelt was being mourned by millions. Bob came home, rebuilt his life, painful hour by painful day, by painful week, by painful month, by painful year. Hearing he and Danny Inoue, who was wounded on a mountain not far from where he was, talk about the recovery they spent together for all those literally several years it was astounding. God, what courage Bob Dole had. He then went to school in the GI Bill, came to Washington with the New Frontier, bravely voted for civil rights and voting rights in the years of the Kennedys, Lyndon Johnson, and Martin Luther King, Jr. Ran for president on a ticket with Gerald Ford. And through the ages of Nixon, Carter, Reagan, Bush the Elder, and Clinton, Bob was literally the master of the Senate. We served together for 25 years. We disagreed, but we were never disagreeable with one another. Not one time that I can think of. I found Bob to be a man of principle, pragmatism, and enormous integrity. He came into the arena with certain guiding principles to begin with devotion to country, to fair play, to decency, to dignity, to honor, to literally attempting to find the common good. That's how he worked with George McGovern to fight hunger in America. 
particularly as it affected children and around the world. He worked with Teddy Kennedy and Tom Harkin to bring down the barriers of Americans living with disabilities. A profound change and a profound act of grace. He worked with Daniel Patrick Moynihan to literally save Social Security because Bob believed every American deserved to grow old with their basic dignity, basic dignity intact. And over the opposition of many in his own party, and some in mine, he managed to build or create the federal holiday in the name of Martin Luther King Jr. Bob Dole, Bob Dole did that. He never forgot where he came from, and I never forgot what he said to our colleagues about the effort for the King holiday. And I'll quote, he said, no first-class democracy can treat people like second-class citizens. No first-class democracy can treat people like second-class citizens. Bob didn't hate government, knew the people who needed it most were the people most in need. He wanted government to work, to work for folks like him who came up the hard way. Just give everybody a chance, Joe, just a chance. During the Depression, Bob's parents moved into the basement of their three-room, not three-bedroom, their three-room home in Russell, Kansas, so they could rent out, quote, the upstairs. Bob understood hardship. He had known hardship, and he never, he never forgot it. He never forgot the people as well who sent him to Washington, people from Russell and from Kansas. Bob was a man who always did his duty, who lived by a code of honor. Almost seems strange to say that today, but he lived by a code of honor, and he meant it. Just as his colleagues, Republican and Democrat, looked at him, I think they saw him the same way I did. Just ask any who served with him at the time. Bob Dole, fit my dad's description, he said, you must be a man of your word. Without your word, you're not a man. Bob Dole was a man of his word. He loved his country, which he served his whole life. The Bible tells us, to whom much is given, much is expected. And Bob Dole, for all his hardship, believed he'd been given the greatest gift of all. He was an American. He was an American, and he felt it. Let's be honest. Bob Dole was always honest, sometimes to a fault. <laughs> he once endured the wrath of his fellow Republicans when there was a legitimate fight going on to defund Amtrak. Now, I've traveled over a million, 200,000 miles on Amtrak because I commuted every single day. It came time for literally the deciding vote, the deciding vote on whether we're going to defund Amtrak. And he cast the vote against his party, deciding to keep funding Amtrak. And obviously, you might guess he was asked, why? Why would you do that? He said, it's the best way to get Joe Biden the hell out of here at night so he's not home no more. <laughs> Excuse my language. But... True story. Absolutely true story. God, I love the guy. As I said, he was always honest. But. Bob relished a good political fight, as much as anybody I've ever served with in the 36 years I was in the Senate. And Bob gave as good or better than he got. 
He was a proud Republican. He chaired his party. He led its caucus in the United States Senate, and he bore the banner as its nominee for vice president and president of the United States. He could be partisan, and that was fine. Americans have been partisan since Jefferson and Hamilton squared off in George Washington's cabinet. But like them, Bob Dole was a patriot. He was a patriot. And here's what his patriotism teaches us, in my view. As Bob Dole himself wrote at the end of his life, and I quote him, I cannot pretend that I have not been a loyal champion of my party, but I've always served my country best when I did so first and foremost as an American. End of quote. First and foremost, as an American. That was Bob Dole. Liddy, that was your husband. That was your dad. Always as an American. He understood that we're all part of something much bigger than ourselves. And he really did, I felt. He really understood it. And the compromise isn't a dirty word. It's the cornerstone of democracy. Consensus is required in a democracy to get anything done. That's how you get things done. Again, listen to Bob Dole's words, not mine. I'm quoting him again. I learned that it's difficult to get anything done unless you can compromise. Not your principles, but your willingness to see the other side. Those who, suggest, those who suggest that compromise is a sign of weakness misunderstand the fundamental strength of democracy. End of quote. In his final days, Bob made it clear that he was deeply concerned about the threat to American democracy, not from foreign nations, but from the division tearing us apart from within. And this soldier reminded us, and I quote, too many of us have sacrificed too much in defending freedom from foreign adversaries to allow our democracy to crumble in a state under a state of infighting that grows more unacceptable day by day grows more unacceptable day by day. He wrote this when he knew his days were numbered in small numbers. My fellow Americans, TAPS is now sounding for this soldier of America. Forged in war, tested by adversity. TAPS is now sounding for this patriot driven by a sense of mission to give back to the land that gave everything to him, for which he nearly gave his all. Taps is now sounding for this giant of our time and of all time. We're bidding this great American farewell, but we know as long as we keep his spirit alive, as long as we see each other not as enemies, but as neighbors and colleagues, as long as we remember that we're here not to tear down, but to build up, as long as we remember that, then taps will never sound for Bob Dole. For Bob will be with us always, cracking a joke, moving a bill, finding common ground. In his final message to the nation, Bob said that whenever he started a new journey, whenever he started a new journey, the first thing he would do, and I quote, is sit back and watch for a few days, then start standing up 
for what he thought was right, end of quote. Bob has taken his final journey. He's sitting back now watching us. Now it's our job to start standing up for what's right for America. I salute you, my friend. Your nation salutes you. And I believe the words of the poet R.G. Ingersoll when he described heroism better fit you than anyone I know. And Ingersoll wrote the following. When the will defies fear, when duty throws the gauntlet down to fate, when honor scorns to compromise with death, that is heroism. The flights of angels, things that sing thee to thy rest, Bob. God bless Bob Dole. God bless America. And may God protect our troops. Mr. President, let's try that again. <clears throat> Mr. President, Madam Vice President, distinguished guests all, Elizabeth and Robin, Bob Dole was a Kansas native son he, along with his hero, Dwight David Eisenhower, are Kansas's favorite son, and they represent the vision and the promise of America. Life in our state molded Bob and Ike, open prairies, 
wind, always the wind, wheat fields, agriculture, where man is at the mercy of chance and weather, but can still be confident in the dignity of his labor. Bob's early life in Russell, Kansas, where the population hovered around 2,000, included the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression. Bob characterized Russell when addressing the Russell High School graduating class of 1986. He said, there are two kinds of education in this world. There's one where you give yourself and another you get from others. You can get an education on the farm or in a factory or in a science lab, in a church pew, most of all, if you're from Russell, you can get an education just by looking at life around you. When I was a boy, I doubt we knew the names of our congressmen or senators, but we were blessed to have friends and neighbors who knew and cared for one another. When times were tough, people were tougher. When the winds howled and part of the prairie itself was blown away, I could barely see to deliver the newspapers on my paper route. But because I came from Russell, because I came from Kansas, I was granted a special vision, one which has seen me all the years since, one which you can rely on just the same. And he defined this Kansas vision by saying, my friends, I hope that you will never stop looking at the stars. I hope you will never forget our state motto, to the stars through difficulties. I hope that you will never stop believing in things you cannot see. I hope that your future is as hospitable and beckoning as mine was when I stood on a similar platform more than 40 years ago. I hope that in the making of life for yourselves, you won't neglect serving your country. Most of all, I hope that wherever you go and whatever you do, Russell will go with you. And for then, I know that you will be well-guided. And well-guided he was in attaining his vision and embodying the promise of America. When we lost Bob on Sunday, there was a pause throughout the state of Kansas, as Kansans from all walks of life stopped to reflect. Bob Dole was a person who meant something to everyone in the coffee shop, the campaign trail, the halls of Congress. Whether we were in Topeka, Abilene, Wichita, or Dodge City, I saw Bob Dole connect with Kansans always on a personal level. He would share with them this vision, this promise, and he would help them to achieve it, just like the folks in Russell did in supporting him. Now, as a young staffer and later a member of the House of Representatives, following in Senator Dole's footsteps, I certainly understood Bob Dole's influence and power. On a Thursday, in 1983, he would be fighting to protect Social Security with President Reagan, Senator Moynihan, others in the White House. And then on Saturday, he would be listening to Thelma in Sharon Springs, Kansas, telling him that Social Security meant to her daily life and pocketbook. And when he returned to Washington with that empathy of his and knowing Kansas and knowing Thelma, it enabled him to win the victories that he did for the disabled, for veterans, for the hungry, or for any of the issues of the day that needed negotiation, steady compromise, and the vision of America's promise. Bob never lost his common sense 
and famous wit. It was embedded in his nature to deliver that punchline, deadpan, knowing, waiting for the room to light up, which it always did, for the barriers to come down, letting the air out of the partisan, the partisan balloons. Dole's manner and influence were so strong that if I were for something, people thought Bob was for something. And I never informed them or Bob otherwise. <laughs> well, the work we did was serious. It was a different time. There were lighthearted times, too. I would call up his chief of staff and say, where's my speech? And the scramble was off to get the leader's uh, remarks. They eventually figured it out. It was Roberts again. And I made sure my staff didn't take calls from Dole's office for the rest of the week. <laughs> when his official public service came to an end, Bob could have faded away with his dear Elizabeth, telling stories, remembering, remembering the good old days, but that was not his nature. There was still so much vision and promise, still so much he could do for his fellow veterans and for his nation. Let everyone know, without Bob Dole, there would not be a World War II memorial. Bob also stressed at the time that there should also be a memorial to Ike so that veterans could salute and thank their commanding general. That effort took 24 years. And again, with Bob's help, we dedicated the Eisenhower Memorial last year. Bob Dole understood that it was just not recognition that this greatest generation deserved. It was reflection and renewal. And it was for the greatest generation to inspire the next generation. There is no better display of the vision and promise of America than every weekend when the honor flights would roll up to the World War II Memorial, Kansas veterans, escorted by Kansas high school students, would visit their memorial to reflect on their fight to preserve a free world. And there was Bob, shaking every hand, posing for every picture, listening to all the stories and the thanks, the thanks of a still grateful nation. When Elizabeth told us he passed in his sleep, and we all knew that an era had come to an end, my first reaction was one of sadness and grief, losing a dear friend and mentor. But then thinking about it, I think the good Lord touched Bob's hand and told him it was time to come home, see his folks, that there were quite a few World War II veterans and some from Korea and Vietnam who were looking forward to thanking him, as well as folks who were disabled, quite a few dogged cat lovers, and quite a few folks from farm country still upset about something. <laughs> and a whole passel of folks from Kansas and all over, a lot of them Republicans who say they voted for him, and some Democrats who say they should have. And then he said, don't worry, Bob. Our heavenly gates are guarded by United States Marines. So thank you, Lord for enabling us to live in such a time and space that gave the us the opportunity and privilege to know Bob Dole, a Kansas star who truly shined through difficulty.
Mr. President, Madam Vice President, distinguished guests, Elizabeth, Robin, I'm honored. I've always thought that life has no blessing like that of a good friend. And to know Bob was to know the truth of that statement. Bob's friendship was a blessing that enriched my life beyond measure. His dedication to public service, his determination to keep Washington and Congress places of civility, and his kindness to Linda and me made our friendship a blessing as rich as life offers. When I arrived in the Senate in 1987, Bob was literally one of the very first people to reach out. We served on the Finance and Agriculture Committees together, and almost from the beginning, we seemed to have similar views on agriculture, nutrition, many other issues. Bob faced the world, both its cruelties and its kindness, with humility, with humanity, and of course, with humor. I remember my very first appearance with Bob after we were both elected leaders in 1994. It was at a reception where he noted that my election was received with great enthusiasm in farm country. Because for the first time, you had two Senate leaders from farm states. He said every farmer in America that very week ordered a new tractor. And Bob set the bar for me, and I suspect many others. When he'd share that story about when he first came to Congress, a reporter asked what his agenda was going to be. He said, I'm going to sit and watch for just a couple of days, and then I'm going to stand up and do what's right. And that's exactly what he did. As the president noted, he stood up for minorities early in his career when he broke party ranks and voted for the landmark Civil Rights and Voting Rights Acts. He stood up for the elderly when he worked with Pat Moynihan literally to save Social Security. He stood up for the young when he worked with my fellow South Dakotan, George McGovern, on nutrition assistance. And he stood up for the disabled when he worked with Ted Kennedy and Tom Harkin on the Americans with Disabilities Act. And boy, did he stand up for his fellow veterans, as Pat just noted. As the chairman of the World War II Memorial Campaign, I know from many conversations how important that accomplishment was. He even remarked to me once, thought about being buried there. Well, that may not be his final resting place. I think of Bob every single time I visit. Of course, these are all the things that made Bob Dole great. 
But as Bill Rogers once put it in one of Bob's favorite sayings, it's great to be great, but it's far greater to be human. Almost everyone has heard the Bob Dole stories of amazing heroics and his recovery from injury in World War II. But few know the Bob Dole who called a Florida dentist in 1993 to encourage him after losing his right arm and help him find a specialist to get a prosthetic arm. And few people know the story about Bob Dole and the detour he took in his presidential campaign in 1996. He was in Indianapolis and he left the campaign for a few hours to attend a graduation party for a young girl who'd become paralyzed because of a car accident. Or as Pat already noted, the Bob Dole, who waited at those airport gates for honor flights to greet veterans with a salute and a thank you. He touched many people through his small acts of kindness, including me. He taught me a lot when I became Senate leader, but the teaching didn't end when I left the Senate. When I lost my election in 2004, once again, Bob was one of the very first to offer me his guidance and his support. He helped me find a speaker's bureau. He encouraged me to join him at his law firm. It's a decision I never regretted, in part because it gave me the opportunity to spend a lot more time with him. I can't help but think of the first time I said farewell to Bob. It was when he left the Senate in 1996. I remember he quoted a poem by Carl Sandburg in his final speech on the Senate floor. I tell you, the past is a bucket of ashes. I tell you, yesterday is a wind going down. A sun dropped in the West. I tell you, there is nothing in the world only an ocean of tomorrows, a sky of tomorrows. Bob didn't always have an easy life. He faced some hard yesterdays, physical, political, personal losses. But for all he did lose, he never lost himself. He never lost his sense of humor. He never lost his sense of integrity. He never lost his love for his hometown, Russell, Kansas, or his deep, deep love for Elizabeth and Robin. And he never lost his hope for tomorrow. His life was a testament to Will Rogers' truth that the things that make us human, the laughs we share, the burdens we bear, can make us great.
I stand here with a heavy heart and also as a grateful and proud daughter. I have had an incredible 67 years with my dad. Not many people get that time, and I'm so thankful. I will be brief today to help me make it through this and to make dad smile because a lot of us in this room know how much he appreciated brevity. I want to start by thanking all of you for being with us today. I think I can speak for Elizabeth when I say the outpouring of love and respect is so heartwarming. We are truly lifted by your presence. And thank you, Mr. President, for your warm remarks. I'll always treasure your recent visit to Dad and Elizabeth and I at the Watergate. It was wonderful, and I loved listening to you share all your stories about the time you served together. And I want to say thank you to his extended family, and now mine, former colleagues, former staff, current staff, members of his household, Elizabeth's staff, who I've gotten to know really well this last couple days, the brunch crew, all of his visitors and friends and family who called him regularly. He so enjoyed his time with all of you. And I want to say thank you to his medical team. And believe me, it was quite a team. His team on the East Coast and the West Coast for your dedication and for giving us so many wonderful years with Dad, especially this last year. We can't thank you enough. Finally, I want to thank his caregivers. I will be eternally grateful to you for providing extraordinary care and compassionate care to my dad and for always answering my many calls and texts with grace. There were a lot, believe me. The last years have been such a gift to me. I feel so fortunate I was able to spend hundreds of hours with my dad and talk to him almost every single night on the phone. We talked about everything under the sun. He told me things I never knew. He asked about my life, about my friends' lives. We made lots of calls to family to former colleagues in the Senate and in the House, to former staff. He shared feelings he had, had not shared before with many of these people. It was a wonderful experience for me to listen to these conversations and such a gift to them and to Dad. My dad is the most generous person I have ever known. He was a giver, not a taker. He cared more about others than he did about himself. He told me he set a personal goal to help at least one person every day of his life. Then he said, I'm not sure I've been able to meet my goal. I said, Dad, you've got to be kidding. Some days you help one person, and other days you help 40,000 people. I think you've met and exceeded your goal. Well, you may be right, he said. There is no one who helped, there is no one he helped more than me. He's always been there for me, through thick and through thin. He always had my back, even when I made mistakes, and believe me, I made quite a few. 
He believes in giving second chances, and I know that firsthand. He was my rock. My dad was an animal lover, and we share that love. You've heard a lot about his work in animal welfare, but I'd like to share a few personal stories about his love for animals. When I was a little girl, my cousins and I would visit his parents in Russell every summer. Grandma would often have animals for us to play with. One year when I got home, I cried and cried because I didn't know what would happen to the little kitten that I played with and grew to love. Dad left on a trip to Kansas, and much to my surprise, he brought the kitten home with him on the plane for me. We named the kitten Rusty because he started in Russell. Recently, I lost my dog, Cooper. Dad was the first one to call me. He consoled me and he said all the right things. The support, that support meant the world to me. Soon he began to encourage me to get another dog. Quite frequently he encouraged me to get another dog. And I'd tell him, I just don't know if, if I'm ready, but he kept encouraging me and eventually he got me a puppy. And I wanted to name my puppy after Dad. But, you know, I didn't want to name him Bob. <laughs> so I decided to name him Jojo after his middle name, Joseph. And we visited many, many times. Dad always wanted me to bring Jojo with me, which wasn't always easy, but we did it. And Dad always wanted me, when I got there, to hold JoJo up so he could get kisses from JoJo. I'd hold him up to his face. And Dad always wanted Elizabeth to get kisses, too. <laughs> and JoJo did a very good job spreading his love. Dad and Elizabeth's dogs, Blazer and Leader, were always trotting into his room. They loved to visit. But it was Blazer who was the most concerned about him. Blazer would lay at his feet whenever he suspected Dad needed special nursing care. And I believe it really helped him because he loved them so much. When I was preparing to speak today, I learned about a farewell letter Dad wrote with a former staff member. None of us knew that he had written this letter. He swore him to secrecy, and he kept a secret. The joke is, you may move on to other jobs, but once you're a Dole staffer, you're always a Dole staffer. And a lot of people in this room know that. I'd like to share, in closing, part of that letter. And I encourage you all to read it in its entirety. It has been released to the public as he wished. Here are his words. As I make the final walk on my life's journey, I do so without fear because I know that I will again not be walking alone. I know that God will be walking with me. I also confess that I'm a bit curious to learn if I am correct in thinking that heaven will, will, will look a lot like Kansas. <laughs> and to see, like others who have gone before me, if I will still be able to vote in Chicago. <laughs> I do have one request to make of you. Since I was dedicated, excuse me, since it was de dedicated in 2004, 
It has been my honor to go as often as I could to the World War II Memorial here in Washington, D.C. to welcome and thank the World War II veterans and all veterans who are visiting there. Since I won't be making that visit anymore, I hope that you will and that you will ask your children and grandchildren to visit veterans memorials across America and to never forget the sacrifice made not just by my generation, but by all those who wear the uniform of our country. My final words are the exact ones that Dwight Eisenhower used to conclude his speech in Abilene nearly seven decades ago. I believe in the future of the United States of America. I will miss him so much. I think I will still talk to him every night. I love you, Dad, and I promise you will never walk alone. Thank you.
readings from the New Testament. And one of the scribes came up and asked him, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. The word of the Lord. Mr. President, Mr. Madam Vice President, uh, distinguished guests and Dole staff, having served uh, with Senator Dole for 20 years, I am honored to read a poem by Linda Ellis that Senator Dole often included in his speeches in later years. Uh, I believe we will hear in these words a description of the man whose life, whose leadership, and whose legacy we celebrate today. I read of a man who stood to speak at the funeral of a friend. He referred to the dates on the tombstone from the beginning to the end. He noted first came the date of the birth and spoke the following date with tears. But he said what mattered most of all was the dash between the years. For that dash represents all the time that they spent life on earth and now only those who love them know what that little line is worth. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash. What matters is how we live and love and how we spend our dash. So think about this long and hard. Are there things you'd like to change? For you never know how much time is left that still can be rearranged. If we could just slow down enough to consider what's true and real and always try to understand the way other people feel. Be less quick to anger and show appreciation more and love the people in our lives like we've never loved before. If we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, remembering that this special dash might only last a little while. So when your eulogy is being read, with your life's actions to rehash, would you be proud of the things they say about how you spent your dash? President Biden, Vice President Harris, distinguished guest, beloved Elizabeth, and thank you, Robin, for reminding me that your dad loved brevity. I grew to love 
my brother in Christ, Robert Joseph Dole. I am entering my 19th year in the Senate, and one of the high points, though I came after uh, the Honorable Robert Dole had left, was to meet Elizabeth. Elizabeth is one of the most ethically congruent people I know. To know you is to love you. I know the many phone calls and how I have been blessed by our friendship. Your spirituality dwarfs my own, but it rubbed off on Bob. <laughs> I used to have furtive rendezvous with Bob in this very cathedral. So many memorial services, he was here. Sometimes pushed in a wheelchair, but I would at the end of the service bolt around the side of the cathedral for our rendezvous at the four. We really got to know one another well, particularly uh, when we were, uh, I was able to work with him on the World War II Memorial and learn so much from this great patriot. As I listened to the readings, I thought about him. What an appropriate reading. Uh, for the Old Testament, Isaiah 40, 31, they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles, run and not be weary, walk and not faint. I used to wonder, did, did we get that right? It seems it should be run and not faint, walk and not be weary. But the pedestrian and prosaic movements of life can often push you to the point of fainting far more than those emergency moments with the adrenaline rush. And then, what a beautiful passage for the New Testament. Love, agape, understanding, creative, redemptive, goodwill for humanity, which describes the life and legacy of Robert Dole. I'm still working on calling him Bob. I still can't do that. <laughs> I remember Elizabeth when we had the conversation and you put Bob, you said, let me put Bob on the phone and I had the beatific experience of having a conference call with spiritual royalty. And at the end, I had a sense that Bob knew he was cared for by a great shepherd. So I'd like to toss in another verse Psalm 23, verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, 
I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I believe my beloved brother in Christ knew he was cared for by a great shepherd. A shepherd who said in John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Bob was a covert spiritual agent. He did not wear his religion on his sleeves. He resonated with the sentiment of Francis of Assisi, preach the gospel everywhere you go, when necessary, use words. He believed the sentiment of Edgar Guest, I'd rather see your sermon than hear it any day. I'd rather it should walk with me than merely tell the way. This covert spiritual agent believed that he was cared for by a great shepherd who left the chance of cherubims and seraphim and a rainbow-encircled throne in a land where night never comes to make a breakthrough at Bethlehem to see about Bob, to see about you, to see about me. And he could say, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. He knew, I firmly believe, Elizabeth, he knew that there was brevity, as Robin put it, in that valley. I'm not going to be walking around in that valley. I'm not going to be having a picnic in that valley. Yea, though I walk, remember they will walk and not faint. Yea, though I walk through, it's temporary. He knew that he was not in that valley to stay. For 2 Corinthians 5, 1 says, if this earthly tent that we live in is destroyed, praise God, we have a building not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. He knew that. He knew that there was light in the valley of shadows. You cannot have shadows without light to project the shadow. And he could say with the Psalter in the 27th Psalm, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom then shall I fear? He served a savior who said, I am the light of the world. But there was one other thing he knew. He knew, he knew that there was comfort in that valley. And, and we've talked about this day coming. He knew there was comfort for us. That shepherd he loved so much and we love so much once said, Matthew 11, 27 and onward, come unto me, all you who labor and 
are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy. <laughs> my burden is light. I remember when you told me that he died in his sleep. And I said, what a transition. And those words of William Cullen Bryant immediately leaped to my mind for he was telling us how we should aspire to transition. He wrote, so live that when your summon comes to join that innumerable caravan where each must take his chamber in the solemn halls of death, go thou not like the quarry slave scourged to his dungeon at night, but sustained and soothed by an unfaltering trust. Here it is, here's Bob. Approach thy grave as one who wraps the drapery of his couch about him and lies down to pleasant dreams. My brother, in Jesus Christ, ret quiescat in pace, rest in peace.
For our brother Bob, let us pray to our Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am resurrection and I am life. Lord, you consoled Martha and Mary in their distress. Draw near to us who mourn for Bob and dry the tears of those who weep. You wept at the grave of Lazarus, your friend. Comfort us in our sorrow. You raise the dead to life. Give to our brother eternal life. You promised paradise to the thief who repented. Bring our brother to the joys of heaven. Our brother was washed in baptism and anointed with the Holy Spirit. Give him fellowship with all your saints. Comfort us in our sorrows at the death of our brother. Let our faith be our consolation and eternal life our hope. Father of all, we pray to you for Bob and for all those whom we love but see no longer. Grant to them eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. May his soul and the souls of all the departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. The funeral service for Senator Bob Dole is drawing to a close. It was said of him, he was a Kansas star who shined through difficulty, one who in his own words was granted a special vision to see in the words of the poet Carl Sandburg, a sky of tomorrows. I want to bring our Chief White House correspondent, Nancy Cordes, who is outside of Washington National Cathedral. Nancy, I want to ask you about the words, the eloquent words from President Biden. He spoke meaningfully, purposefully of Bob Dole's career of bipartisanship and finding common ground. But those in our audience may well remember that two of the most important parts of President Biden's current domestic agenda, the American Rescue Plan, which has already passed, and the pending Build Back Better initiative, quite expensive and pursued entirely through partisan means, meaning with no Republican cooperation. You talk to White House officials all the time. You listen to the president's word on a daily basis. How, is the, how are those two facts presented now in the context of this funeral celebration reconciled? Well, I think that uh, President Biden knew Bob Dole as someone who uh, at times reached across the aisle, at times was fiercely partisan. And Bob Dole himself, when he was the chair of the Republican National Committee, he was asked on, on 60 Minutes about uh, some of uh, his partisan tone from time to time. And he said, look, I'd be out of a job if I didn't take that tone. I think that he understood, President Biden understands that there is a time to reach across the aisle, there is a time to work within your own party. And while these two major pieces of legislation that you describe, Major, are, are no question being worked on by his party alone, President Biden has also notched a significant victory with the help of the other side, and that is this $1 trillion infrastructure bill, something that leaders from both sides of the aisle have tried and failed to do. And the reason that it worked is because you had senators working in the spirit of Bob Dole uh, with the other side, Democrats and Republicans who basically got in a room and hashed out a plan that they felt both sides could live with. And Bob Dole really, uh, uh, you know, set the standard in that regard, whether it had to do with uh, passing landmark legislation to help Americans with disabilities or expanding school lunches or uh, food stamps and in so many other areas. And President Biden, I thought, said something really noteworthy in his eulogy. He said that he disagreed with Bob Dole on so many issues, but he could not think of a time that Dole had been disagreeable. Nancy Cordes outside Washington National Cathedral. Thank you very much. One of the conversations that goes on in America for a person like Bob Dole, what did you give? What did you leave behind? It can be fairly said of Senator Dole more than most. Our coverage will continue on our streaming network, that's CBSN, your local news, and tonight on the CBS Evening News. This has been a CBS News special report. I'm Major Garrett in Washington. Good day. At every stage of my life, I've been a witness 
the greatness of this country. We have raised this memorial to commemorate the service and sacrifice of an entire generation. I say that in politics, honorable compromise is no sin. It is what protects us from absolutism and intolerance. We can lead or we can mislead as the people's representatives. But whatever we do, we will be held responsible. My pledge one time was to make a difference in the life of at least one person every day. Now, I've probably failed in part of that, but I still work at it. And we've been watching a CBS News special report. I'm Tanya Rivero. Thank you for joining us. We are going to stay with the funeral services for Senator Bob Dole. Let's watch. Give rest, Christ, to your servant with your saints, where sorrow and pain are no more, as a sign but life everlasting. Into your hands, O oh merciful Savior, we commend your servant, Bob. Acknowledge we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. Now go forth into the world in peace. Be strong and of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. But love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor. Love yourself. The blessing of God Almighty the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be on you and remain with you in this world in which we live this day and forevermore. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks, Thanks be to God. the dark Cause an endless storm There's a golden sky And the sweet silver sounds of a lark Walk on through the wind
And that concludes the funeral services at the National Cathedral for Senator Bob Dole. Hello, everyone. I'm Tanya Rivero. Thank you for joining us. Once again, we've been watching the funeral for late Senator Bob Dole. Friends, family, and Washington dignitaries are all saying goodbye to the late senator. CBS News congressional correspondent Chris Van Cleve joins us now from the World War II Memorial. Hi, Chris. So how are people remembering Bob Dole at the World War II Memorial today? Well, this will really be the only public event uh, memorializing Senator Dole. He laid in state at the Capitol, but that was only open really to family, friends, invited guests, and, and, and Capitol staff. Of course, the, the funeral uh, was limited attendance. And while behind me, the, the actual folks that will be enjoying the program, only about 40 seats, they had planned to have uh, more than more than couple hundred. Uh, that plan got thinned down. Of course, we are in the middle of the pandemic. But what you can't see are the people that are ringing the outside of the memorial uh, here already gathered ahead of this event. So this is uh, the public's opportunity here in Washington uh, to send their condolences to pay their respects to Senator Dole. And Chris, many credit the late senator for being the strongest force behind opening this memorial. Why was it so important to him? Well, in fact, in 2011, a plaque was added near the entrance uh, recognizing Bob Dole's work to get this memorial built. You know, he, he led the fundraising effort. This was built with private funds. Uh, and he spearheaded that effort uh, along with actor Tom Hanks. Uh, so it was seen as instrumental in having this place built. Obviously, a World War II veteran himself who was grievously wounded spent 39 months in a hospital recovering from his wounds. Uh, you know, the, the greatest generation and their service was never far from his mind. You know, after this memorial was built, he was uh, heavily involved in honor flights, those, those flights that would bring World War II veterans here to Washington, would bring them to this memorial. He would often meet them at the airport to salute them and thank them for their service or would surprise them here at the memorial. He came as often as he could. And remind us once again how his service during World War II shaped the rest of his life and his career in politics. Well, so, uh, you know, Senator Dole, when he went into the military, he had dreams of being a surgeon. Uh, he had been an athlete. Um, he had been a, a, a model back in Kansas. He uh, had a bright future, and uh, he was serving in the Italian mountains when he was wounded by when he was wounded uh, with an explosive round to the shoulder. Um, he was for a time paralyzed. They weren't sure that he would walk again, let alone that he would even survive those wounds. Thirty-nine months in hospitals. Think about that. Mm. Thirty-nine months recovering. Uh, and while he never regained uh, the, the full use of his right arm and right hand, uh, he made a, a miraculous recovery. It, it, it certainly defined uh, the rest of his life, his perseverance, his patriotism, uh, his desire to just make things work. You know, he often went back to a piece of advice one of his doctors gave him, which was, you can't, you can't think about what you've lost, you've got to think about what you have. And, and that sort of translated to a worldview of his as he uh, campaigned for and, and uh, got past the Americans with Disabilities Act, which was don't judge people on what they can't do, judge them on what they can do. So his his World War II service, his patriotism uh, and, and living his life with a disability uh, was fundamental to uh, Bob Dole, the senator, Bob Dole, the majority leader, working on things from childhood nutrition to food stamps and, of course, his focus on veterans and the disabled. And Chris, you know, over the past few days, you've obviously speaking, been speaking to a lot of lawmakers about Senator Dole. What are some of the things that you've learned about him that really stand out to you? 
Well, you know, there are only about eight senators that, that served with Senator Dole that are still serving in the Senate, uh, about 30 lawmakers overall uh, still up there. But, you, you know, the, the legacy of, of Senator Bob Dole was somebody who was hardworking, who had this, this perseverance and this desire to, to get things done. You know, his, his daughter, Robin, today said that his personal goal was to help one person a day. And that certainly wasn't lost on people on the Hill. Uh, there's been a lot of, uh, of talk about the civility, the respect, the humor that he brought to things. Uh, you heard the president say that they disagreed often, but that he never found Senator Dole to be disagreeable. Uh, it's a sentence you wouldn't hear much up on Capitol Hill today, it seems. So uh, there was a lot of talk about, uh, you know, the era of, of Senator Bob Dole, a time when people did reach across the aisle, where bipartisanship was the, the minimal expectation, not uh, about as the best you could hope for. And Chris, um, when you listen to everyone who eulogized Senator Dole today, including the president, did all of that come across today in all of those eulogies and speeches we heard at the National Cathedral? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you heard you heard from colleagues and, and friends in the Senate who told stories about not only his perseverance, his patriotism, his ability to to accept a setback and keep moving. Uh, you also heard about his humor and his civility uh, and the sides of Bob Dole that the public that necessar didn't necessarily see. Stepping away from his presidential campaign for an afternoon to go to a graduation party for uh, a young woman who had been paralyzed in a car accident. Um, calling a dentist in Florida who had lost his right arm and helping that man find, uh, find the right specialist to get a prosthetic. Uh, you, you heard from his daughter uh, uh, very touchingly about their their, their, their last couple of years together and, and the quality time they spent, uh, you know, she, she remarked on, uh, again, how his personal goal was to just help one person a day and how he said he, he didn't know if he'd met that goal. And she disagreed rather strongly, saying that there were days you helped one person and other days you helped 40,000. I think also you heard from his chief of staff uh, towards the end there where she read a poem called The Dash and choked up this idea that what matters is, the, is that dash between the dates of birth and death. And what you did with that time, certainly uh, you, you heard a, many, many testaments there to uh, a life well lived, uh, somebody who took diversity with grace, uh, adversity with grace, I should say, and, and, and pushed through life's hard challenges, life's setbacks uh, to, to, to continue to just move forward, to, uh, to find a way to make things work. A life well lived indeed. Chris Van Cleve at the World War II Memorial. Thank you so much. Sure thing. The Supreme Court will leave a Texas abortion law in effect, but allow for abortion providers to continue challenging the law. Texas has one of the most restrictive abortion laws in the country. The procedure is banned after about six weeks, a time before many women know they are pregnant. It also delegates enforcement of the law to private citizens, allowing anyone to sue providers or others who aid in the procedure. Today's ruling means the law will stay in place while providers challenge how the law is enforced in lower courts. For more on this, I want to bring in CBS News chief legal correspondent Jan Crawford. Hi, Jan. So first off, I want to get your reaction to the Supreme Court's ruling. Was this expected or were you at all surprised? You know, I think after the arguments, it seemed like it was going to be very difficult for the court to issue any kind of broad ruling that allowed the Biden administration to go forward with its challenges or even the providers in a, in a more sweeping way that they were hoping to, because they would have had to completely upend our understandings of the role of the state and federal courts and how they work together. I mean, I guess what, uh, Tanya, I was most surprised by was that they took up this case in the first place in this early pre-enforcement stage before anyone's even been sued. Uh, under this law for violating it. Uh, and now, as we see today, I mean, it was really just a waste of time. The court mm -hmm. has just kicked the can down the road in this opinion, and they're going to have to deal with it at some point in the future again. But, Jan, they are saying that providers can go forward with legal challenges, correct? I mean, on the one hand, they could have just fully stopped the uh, legal proceedings right, right here, correct? They could have, and they basically did, because they mm -hmm. said the, the providers can only sue, sue a very narrow group of defendants, like state licensing officials. They can't sue state court judges to prevent them enforcing it. They can't sue, sue uh, 
county clerks for uh, pre to prevent them from docketing the case. They so they can't stop any of the lawsuits. Uh, the providers can't now under this ruling today. They can only sue this you know really small group of defendants that don't really have that much power anyway. So it, it's kind of like I mean you want to talk about a hollow victory. I mean that's not a lot there for the providers. Their focus will be and should be in the state courts, and that's mm -hmm. where all the action is happening. And I think today the takeaway is the Supreme Court saying you can try, uh, but really uh, this is going to this is really going to get solved in the state courts, this state law issue. And what were the actual arguments that the providers brought to the Supreme Court in this case? So, you know, I think it's important to keep in mind that this case is not about the right to abortion. It's not about whether to overturn Roe versus Wade. That's another case that they just heard arguments on about a Mississippi 15-week ban. This case is purely procedural. It's super complicated and it's super complex because this is a very unique law. And Texas officials wrote it that way on purpose to try to keep people from suing to block it before it actually gets enforced. So right. they said, you know, the state officials, uh, we're not going to enforce it. You know, we just have the ban on the books and hey, but you know, you private parties, y'all can go out there and sue and get $10,000 if, you know, you win a civil, you know, in civil court. So I think that's what's really important to keep in mind. Now, be that as it may, and this is this unique law, the Biden administration tried to jump in to challenge it. The abortion providers had already sued back in July, and they were trying to keep that case going. And there, the bulk of their argument solely was that this is a constitutional right to abortion, the state law infringes it, and they can't do an end run around, you know, uh, the, the, our ability to sue to challenge it by saying, oh, we're not enforcing it, we're leaving it to these, these private parties, that that was nullification mm -hmm. of, of constitutional rights that were enshrined in the federal constitution. And so what is the status of the Biden administration's challenge of the Texas, of this Texas law? Done. They're out. The court said in a separate opinion today that they uh, were dismissing that case as improvidently granted, which means the court is saying we never should have taken